invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel according to Matthew chapter 2. I'll begin reading in verse 1 in just a moment. I love to tell the story of Jesus. And uh, that's what I'm so looking forward to today. I'm going to tell you the story of Jesus. And I'm going to tell it to you from the eyes of pagans who saw a star and followed it. And God changed their life. And any time you follow the light that God gives you, he changes your life. Always and forever. And the real need in America and around the world today is for us to obey the light that God gives. Because the Bible says in John 1, 9, he lighteth every man who comes into the world. Everyone's without excuse. God has given light. But oftentimes we argue with the light instead of acknowledging the light. That's well, a good introduction sermon. If you're physically able this holiday season, stand to your feet in honor of the Word of God. Listen carefully to the story and hear it like maybe you've never heard it before. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who was born? king of the Jews, for we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And would you not agree it's amazing how Jesus still troubles people? Man, he didn't come to trouble you. <laughs> he came to change you. The Bible says, and when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes and the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. So they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea. And by the way, isn't that amazing? Some people know where he was born, but they've never allowed their heart to become a personal Bethlehem where he could be born in you. The Bible says, for thus it is written by the prophet, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the young child. And when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. When they heard the king, they departed. And behold, the star which they had seen in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceedingly great joy. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented gifts to him, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed from their own country another way. Our Father, speak, Lord Jesus, amen. You may be seated. It's a simple text and a simple title and a simple story. Wise men followed the star. And in a few moments, I'm going to talk about three things that they found by following the light that God gave them. You know, I read this story, and the first thing that comes to mind is I find myself personalizing the text and asking the question, they found God by following a star. They found God by following the light that God gave them. How did you find God? Has God made himself known to you? Could it be this Christmas season God is shaking the heavens to make himself known to you? Is it possible in this hour God is going to reveal to you that he's been in the process of making himself known and you've resisted the light and attempted to push it back when God is making himself known? The writer of Hebrews put it this way. God who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers. God spoke by the prophets. Has in these last days spoken to us by his Son whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. When you, when you look into the, to the manger, 
in that stable and you see the Christ child, I want to remind you of something. He created the world. Let's give him his proper due today. Let's give credit where credit is due. The Bible says he's the brightness of God's glory and the express image of God's person. They say in the New Testament about the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen my Father. I and my Father are one. We're of the same essence. He is actually saying, I am God. The Bible says he upholds all things by the word of his power. And then it moves quickly to Calvary and says when he is himself purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. God gu guiding, directing wise men from the east so they can find God, giving them light. They're obeying and following the light and it gives greater light. God speaks in various ways, various times through the prophets speaks to us through his son. He spoke to Moses through a burning bush. He led the Israelites by a cloud in the daytime, a pillow of fire at night. He used animals to get other people's attention. He used a donkey to speak. He used a great fish. Some refer to him as a whale. He used a rooster. He spoke to me through a carpenter. 90% of the people that will ever give their life to Jesus Christ in this continent, we'll receive a simple invitation to church. 33, might I add, on January the 7th, 34 years ago. Because a carpenter cared enough to give enough light to say, I wish you would come to church where I could hear more about the light. And I followed that light till I received more light till God made himself known to me and changed my life. Now in our passage before us, we see God leading and directing through a star. They follow the star and hear a simple message. I want you to get a hold of this today. They follow the star and I want to tell you what they found. Number one, they followed the star and they found God in the house. So wouldn't you like to believe that in this house of God, that somebody, wouldn't it be awesome <laughs> for somebody to find God in the house this morning? I went to the house of God one time and found God in the house. Well, they found him because of the foretelling of prophecy. What we read in Matthew chapter 2 had been recorded so many times in the Old Testament, but it is a quote from Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. Isaiah, writing six to 800 years previous, said, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which translate God with us. And so when Christ came of the virgin birth, the Bible teaches that it was God coming into this world, clothing himself with flesh, coming to show us how much he loves us, how he was willing to die for us because we were in desperate need of somebody to deal with our sins. Isaiah said again in chapter 9, verse 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Government shall be upon his shoulders. His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice. From that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord will perform this. Did you know that 330 Old Testament prophecies or predictions concerned himself with the birth of God's son? I'm telling you from Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15 to the book of Malachi, 330 times God shouted from the pages of Scripture, He's coming, He's coming, He's coming. And we need to know the foretelling of the prophecy of the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's one thing to read the foretelling of prophecy. It is another thing to have the privilege to read of the fulfillment of promises. The Bible teaches in verses 
2 and 3, that these wise king finally show up, wise men show up in Jerusalem looking for the king of the Jews. Wise men were referred to as magi. They were from Persia. They came with knowledge of science, agriculture, mathematics, history. They'd even gone so far as to study the occult. Uh, their religion and political influence continued to grow until they became, listen to this, the most prominent and most powerful group of advisors in all the Medo-Persian and Babylonian empire. You've heard of the law of the Medes and the Persians recorded in Daniel and Esther in particular. These brilliant scholars at, at least and certainly at best show up in Jerusalem. And now listen carefully. I want to make sure you catch this. The question they pose is, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? There's a present tense verb there. And you may say, what is the, the emphasis there? It means the question was repeated. Uh, they've heard that he's going to be born close by there. And so everybody they said, he said, hey, where is he that is born king of the Jews? You know why I didn't keep asking it? Nobody could tell him. So he asked it again. It should have been common knowledge. What they're thinking is we've traveled hundreds of miles from Persia. And so we've come. Undoubtedly, you folks know, where is he who is born king of the Jews? Everyone should have known of such an event. And the Bible says when he used these words, king of the Jews, well, that's the title that's been given to Herod, which is part Jew and, and part Gentile. And the Bible says he was troubled. And my question is, why would anyone be troubled that God has come to reveal himself to man? Why, why would a king be troubled that God has sent one to be the king of the world? Because it was true in the first century, and it's true today, they are people that desire to remain king of their own life. They're not willing to acknowledge that they've sinned. They're not willing to acknowledge that their self-righteousness and self-effort is not enough. And so it troubles them. There, there would be people today, if they'd hear this message on the Internet or in this service, or someone passes a tape along to them, they would say, that is outright agitating, that a man would stand and make such a claim that everyone must come to Christ. The word troubled was interesting. It is too strong to be translated disturbed. It's been said in the Greek New Testament, it would best be translated turmoil, terrified, or agitated. In other words, it means that somebody would sit there and they would, it, it would aggravate the, the stew out of them. They'd get agitated. Uh, I'll be glad when this service is over. What claim does he have to say that Christ must become king of my life and no one else, him alone? How narrow. And that creates turmoil. It creates turmoil all across the world to stand and say that he is the only king. These wise men, I think we need to know this this Christmas season. We're Gentiles. From the very my Bible teaches that Jesus or of the world. And it's amazing how Jesus is making himself known. He could have made himself known to anyone. He could have gone to the Pharisees, the Sadducees, to the scribes, to the high priests, to the chief priests. But instead, he went and found some, are you listening, some pagans from Persia unbelievers and he began to speak to them through the stars these guys were astrologers as well you know it's amazing how Jesus has been busy through the ages making himself known to those who need to hear it the most I, I love the story of the Samaritans you remember the Samaritans were half-breeds we have a lot in common I'm a half-breed I'm an Indian Probably got a little that Caucasian in me. Only God knows what else mixtures in with this Lumbee Indian. But I'm glad that the Son of God came to people like me. I'm glad he came to people like the Samaritans. And listen to what he said. You want to hear how he talked about being the Savior of the world? Listen to John 4.42. Jesus is there ministering to Samaritans. You remember the Samaritan woman? Then they said to the woman, Now this is guys that she's telling the story. I've found the Messiah. It says, Now we believe, not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. So what they were saying is, hey, 
you need to put it in this context. They were saying he didn't just come for the Jews. He didn't just come for pure Gentiles. He came. It doesn't matter how mixed up you are. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter how despised you are. He stepped out of heaven to display how much he loves us. He's the Savior of the world. And these wise men were wealthy, scholars, scientists in their own rights. No scholarly person or no uneducated person who follows the light God gives him can miss one day worshiping at the feet of Jesus. In 150 A.D., a Jewish historian by the name of Justin Martyr, remember a Jew now, tells us that Jesus is recorded in the annals of history that Jesus was born in a cave near the village of Bethlehem. Bethlehem translates house of bread. It only stands to reason that God would allow the bread of life to be born. The Bible says in John chapter 6 and verse 48 that this is the bread, listen to this, this is the bread which has come down out of heaven and that the fathers ate in the wilderness and died, but he that eats this bread, this Christmas bread, this God-man bread that came down out of heaven, he shall never die. What a marvelous, mar that's Christmas story there. He's the bread of life, born in the house of bread. Some of you, along with myself, I think on seven different occasions, I've gone to the church of the nativity, built by Constantine. It's a very, very old church. The only way you can enter that church is to duck. They say that door was built very low for the express purpose that all of us would be reminded of the posture in which we should enter the presence of the king. And there on that old cave floor is a place where there's much reason to believe it was there very close by the Christ child was born. When you go in and you find God in the house, they see him as a child, but it is God. If you had been at the manger with the shepherds, it was God. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 3 says this about the Christ child. It teaches that Jesus Christ in him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. No wonder we're invited. Come and worship. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9 teaches that in Jesus Christ all the fullness of the Godhead bodily dwells. That's amazing. You've heard it a different way every now and then at Christmas. But here's these wise men, pagans, that are coming to know the God of the universe. They're accepting the light that God gave them. Could this be true? And they follow that light, traveled hundreds of miles because they believed. There was the feeling throughout the world that there was a great need for a redeemer. The Jews were prophesying and talking of their coming Messiah. And so they were those who did not study the scriptures that still had this belief that there was a need in this world for a redeemer, for a savior, a king. And so with that in mind, they came and they found the Christ child. Now let, let me make three statements. They found God in the house. The wise men are found responding by seeking him. Well, let me ask you a question. If you could come to believe for a moment that God loved you so much that demonstrating his love, he is God being spirit and truth, clothed himself in humanity and came into this world so you could know him. Let me ask you a question. If you could go so far say, I believe he did that. Let me ask you a question. Be honest before God. Would you want to know him? Would you want to know the God who can be known? Well, these wise men said, absolutely. If there's a God to know, we wish to know him and worship him. And that's the call of the Christian gospel. There is a God who has made himself known. There is a God whom you can know. And when you come to know him, you will realize he is worthy of our worship. Wise men came seeking. Herod came opposing. He felt disturbed, threatened when he learned of a coming king. Why? Because he desired to be king of his own life. 
you just need to know. I wish I had more time to just deal with him for a moment. He, he really is not worthy of the time that I give him, King Herod. He was a wicked man. He felt that his oldest son was after his throne. He had him put to death. He found out and then believed that his wife was behind hoping that his oldest son was after the throne. He had his wife put to death. The leader of the Roman world in the first century was Caesar Augustus. Let me give you a quote from history from Caesar Augustus. He gave us a quote concerning King Herod. He said, it is more safe to be Herod's pig than Herod's son. Safer to be Herod's pig than Herod's son. He killed his wife. He killed his mother. He felt she was opposing. And so you can only imagine later, fast forward into the book of Matthew, what did he do when the, when the wise men did not come back bringing him word of where the Christ child was? He said, I don't know how old this Christ child is. He could be two years old by now. So let's go over into Bethlehem and let's kill every child two years old and under. That's the wicked Herod. No wonder you'd rather be his pig than his son. But, but let me tell you who amazes me most. Do I have your attention right now? Let me tell you who amazes me most. The wise men receive a light. They sense God's up to something that is supernatural. They follow the light that God gave them. Anytime you receive the light God gives you, God gives you more light. And as you embrace that light, I believe God will bring you to himself. Someone said to me, I'd like for you to go to church. But God is changing lives at our church. So I went to that church. I sat under the gospel. I didn't own my own Bible. My wife and I would sit near the back. We wouldn't sing the songs, although we sang them wide open when we got back in our car. I didn't know God, but as I continued to go, God, listen, God revealed himself to me. He began to speak to my heart and convict me of my need for his son. And I've come to know him, and I know him so well, now I'm out telling other people how I came to know him and how they can know him. That's what the wise men did. Herod, he opposed him. Herod felt threatened by him. He, he thought it was going to cost him something to know him. <laughs> Let me say something to you, dear friend. It never cost you anything. It's all on the receiving end when you come to God. What in this world could possibly be compared to life everlasting? Forgiveness, hope, peace. But let me tell you who I'm most amazed with. It's the third reaction. It's the chief priest and the scribes. The uh, chief priest were the leaders in temple worship. Oftentimes, you know this, don't you? Oftentimes, the chief priests were men that had served as the high priest. However, oftentimes, the high priest served until they died, but sometimes they did step down and they'd place them in that role. They were the leaders in the worship. Let me tell you what the chief priest would have known. The chief priest would have known enough about the high priest to know that on Yom Kippur, on that one day of the year, the day of atonement, that they would ready themselves with about 27 sacrifices for their own cleanse, cleanse, cleansing, and then they would go into the presence of God in the Holy of Holies, and, and they knew that this was a picture of the fact that one day there was going to be a spotless lamb, a Messiah that would come. And when he came, they would never have to go back into that temple again to offer sacrifice because God was once and for all and forever going to offer a perfect sacrifice. They knew that. That's the chief priest. Leaders in temple worship, closely related to the high priest and his duties. And then who were the scribes? They're lumped together. Experts in the scripture. Stay with me for a moment. Let me just get real practical in your face for a moment. Have you ever heard someone say this? I'll tell you, if you go over there to talk to him about Jesus, you better know your Bible. He flat knows the scriptures. Oh, they're like the scribes, are they? Well, let me ask you something. Can you know Psalm 23 without knowing the shepherd? Can, can you know your Bible without knowing the God it reveals? I mean, here we lump them in. He says, it's one thing to see wise men. It's another thing to see Harry. But we got the chief priests and the scribes, and what are they doing? They're ignoring him. Let me go a step further. They're indifferent toward God's son. Oh, I've got to say this. I've got to get everybody. Y'all come on in close. We've got to get this. has got to be a family room statement here. Listen to this statement. They lived six miles from where he was born, and there's no record that any of them 
traveled six miles to see if what the scriptures predicted about him was true. Come on, good night. I can easily walk a 15-minute mile. In an hour and 15 minutes, I could have walked from Jerusalem five miles south to Bethlehem to see, is this true? They saw the star. And they told him, we saw the star. They brought the experts in. They said, Get right on time. Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. Hey, the king of the Jews is born. Not a single one of them would walk five miles. How many people will die and go to hell because they won't walk a mile, won't get in their fat automobile and drive a couple of blocks to get in a gospel church and to see if there's anything to this Christ child? I'm grateful to God that not only was he born 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem, five miles south from Jerusalem, but I'm glad on January the 7th, 1973, the same God that stepped out of heaven came and was born in the context of a virgin's womb, gave birth to him, placed him there in a stable. I'm glad that same God came to be born in my life. He came to be a sacrifice for us. He said, Johnny, you can't atone for yourself. You can't pay for your own sins. I'm going to pay your sin debt. And that's what he did. That's why he came as a redeemer. He redeemed us. Do you know him? You ought to give him your life. I tell you, I get to thinking about the Christmas story and my sermon gets longer can I get a witness when they first got into Bethlehem there was no room in the end you know why he's not in some of your lives you got it all cluttered up and everything but God but I guarantee you one thing you ever repent and put your faith in him you'll be grateful to God for that sacred place and person that comes in Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that wise men still seek you and when they follow the light that you've shown them, you'll lead them right to, to Jesus. The light led them to Jesus and you're still the light of the world leading us to God. I pray in Jesus' name that someone would find Christ this morning in their life.